All my hope is in Jesus. Amen. That's what this lesson's about today. And we have hope, not only in this world and in this life, but in the world to come. The title of the message, as you see today, is The Kingdom of Hope, God's Treasure Chest. I would like to read, as part of my introduction, from David Trabing. And he says, What is the kingdom of God in the Bible? In short, the kingdom of God is the central theme of Jesus' teaching and the fundamental message of the church founded by him through his disciples. As Mark explains in the gospel account, now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel of the kingdom of God. Matthew and Luke likewise record that Jesus' message was the gospel or glad tidings of the kingdom. Matthew 4.23 and Luke 8. Even though Matthew referred to it as a kingdom of heaven, and Paul once called it the kingdom of Christ and God, the predominant name in the scripture is the kingdom of God. Jesus consistently taught them this same message of hope. The gospel means good news, right? The gospel, the hope, the good news of the kingdom through his ministry. His parables, stories with spiritual lessons often dealt with the kingdom, or this kingdom, this kingdom of hope, which God the Father and his Son had prepared prior to the existence of man at the foundation of the world. So, what is the definition of hope? There are many definitions of hope, but there are basically two kinds of hope. There are two kinds of hope, worldly or temporal hope, and then we have, on the other hand, the hope of believers. In a general sense, hope is a mental focus or feeling of anticipation regarding a future outcome, either of something we want to happen or wish to be true, or don't want to happen or be true. Secular hope is subjective expectation. It may be solidly based or misguided, as it does not consider God's will. We hope for things we want. I hope I get the job. I hope that she'll marry me. I hope my child returns home safely. I hope I don't get sick, and the list goes on and on. But worldly hope is not a virtue it is just as it usually contains some degree of uncertainty, doubt, and personal bias, and can often be misdirected. But let's take a look at the biblical definition. What's the biblical definition of hope? It is sure and confident expectation of receiving what God has promised us in the future. The believer's hope is not a faint or obscure wish, but an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. And we find that in Hebrews 6.19. In Scripture, hope is a virtuous quality because it contains no doubt, always trusting in God's faithfulness and presence, no matter the circumstances, whether good or bad. Now, I will tell you that I have been working on a message um, when I would have opportunity to preach it again. And I was planning to use it today, but I was at work probably a week ago, and one of those moments when the Lord speaks, you might think I'm crazy, like Pastor Tim says, you might think I'm crazy, but the Lord talks to us, doesn't he? Aren't you glad for those moments when he clearly speaks to you? And he says, I want you to go here, and there you will find what I want you to talk about this Sunday. And the subject, obviously, is hope. So I don't know who you are or where you are or what your situations may be today, but I, I will say to you this, that God on purpose gave me this message. And I would like us to take a minute to pray because this isn't my word, this is God's word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth 
of your word. We thank you for Jesus, who is our Savior, who is our hope. Lord, we thank you for the Holy Spirit, who is our comforter, our guide, our teacher, and the inspiration that's behind your word today. We thank you that your word is alive and well, but I'm praying, God, that you will hide in me behind the cross of Jesus and let Jesus be seen. I pray that the words that I speak will be your words, Lord, not mine. Your words have hope and your words have power. We pray that in everything that you be glorified and the people and individuals here in the parking lot and inside, that you would minister to them and you would infuse new life and new hope into them. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. God's treasure chest. There we can find many, many good things, but there are three fundamental things foundational things that we find in there. First of all, we find the foundation of hope. What is the definition of hope? We've already talked about that. Our hope as Christians are not in earthly things, possessions, power, or fame, or even the next leader or president of the United States. But our hope is in not just something, but in the person of Jesus Christ. He is our hope. The word hope is found in the Bible at least 120 times, depending on the translation. So let's take a look into the hope chest and see what we find there today. The foundation of hope. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors but with precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. I like the song that we sang this morning, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean or wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone is our cornerstone, our foundation. Without him, as the central figure of our faith, we do not have hope. Hopelessness is prevalent in our world today, as you know, as you read the headlines or you listen to the news. The negative news and noise is relentless. The feelings of hopelessness can quickly overwhelm us if we do not have a proper foundation. As many of you know, I work in construction, and uh, I know a little bit about foundations, and I know some about building. But what I do know is that if the foundation is not properly laid, the whole su- substructure and the structure will not, will not last. It will It will crumble and it will decay. In Romans 8, 18 through 28, we read these words. I consider that our present suffering are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption, the sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is not hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we have hope for what we do not yet have, we, ha- we wait for it patiently. Let me say that again, verse 25. But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. 
In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And I especially like this verse that you know well, Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. We don't always understand God's ways because his ways are higher than ours and his thoughts are higher than ours. But God has a plan and purpose even in the midst of an evil, wicked world where there's pain and there's suffering and we don't understand why God, why did this happen? Why did that happen to happen to me or to, to my child or to my parent? Ugly things happen because we live in a broken world. Because of Adam and Eve, they messed it up in the beginning. And if it had not been Adam and Eve, it would have been somebody else that messed it up. But thank God that he had a plan. He had a purpose even before the foundation of the world was laid. He had it in place because he knew humans would slip up. But God loves us so much that he gave his only son that we might have hope and so that we might have life. My second point is the source of hope. Our hope comes from knowing what is in the word of God. How can we know about God? How can we know about his miracles, his purpose, and his plan, and especially his plan for you, unless you open the word of God? Hope and faith are inseparable. You cannot have one without the other. Faith or believing in hope and hope in faith. Hebrews 11.1, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. If you get a minute, maybe this afternoon or this evening or in your devotional time, read what we call the faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, and you will see how faith transformed the lives of people just like you and I. In Romans 10.17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. As Pastor Tim often teaches us, we have to get into the word to know the word. And it's through the word that we are infused with new life and hope and purpose. That's where we find it. That is the source of our hope. It is through the word of God that we have eyes to see and ears to hear the hope that we have in and through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Where does hope come from? It comes from knowing or hearing about a bad situation turned good by Jesus. If we don't read the Bible, if we don't go to church and hear it, we won't know about it. But there is a hope, and our hope is steadfast in Jesus alone. The New Testament gives many examples of the miracles he performed in his earthly ministry. And a song that we all love is, Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are, high, you are higher than any other. So he turned water into wine. He opened the eyes of the blind. There is no one like you. And in other accounts, he made the lame to walk again. <laughs> Hallelujah. He still does that today, by the way. I don't know what your situation is, and it may seem too hard for you, and it is too hard for you. <laughs> and I'm not belittling your situation or trying to give you a false hope, but what I will tell you, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is good. He was good from the beginning. He's good now, and he will continue to be good always. And he has a hope and a future for you, according to Jeremiah 29, 11. Go reach, read that scripture as well. God has a plan, a hope, and a future for you. Let's go quickly to the third point that I have, the content of hope. So what do we find there? Let's recap. John 1.14, this ties in more with the, uh, the source of hope. John 1.14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Hope isn't just something or something we hope in, but it is a person, Jesus, the one that we hope in. 
Again, hope is not wishful thinking that brings with it a positive outcome. Faith is believe or belief in the substance of things hoped for. Therefore, hope is the substance that makes our faith real. God the Father took action by sending his son Jesus, who was God in the flesh, that revealed to us the character and the nature of our heavenly Father. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, we find written there, Without faith it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So here we find a key, a key that opens or unlocks something that's very important. Faith is the key that unlocks the hope chest or the treasure chest that Christ has for us. The hope chest of the things that are most important, not only for this time, but for all eternity. Without hope, a person cannot live. One cannot expect to live spiritually or physically without hope. So let's dig a little bit deeper into the hope chest and see what's in it. We've been speaking a lot about love, and that's the first treasure that we find there. Love is indispensable. In 1 Corinthians, we read from the love chapter, Bear with me. Love is indispensable. I speak, if I speak, in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love. I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I can, I can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. And where there are tongues, they will will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. But then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now... These three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. So the first thing we find in the treasure chest is love. The essence and character of love is found in one place. It's found in the person of Jesus Christ, and he is our example. And he was the first fruit back from the dead. And one day, because he died, was buried, and rose again, we have the hope of a new body in a new place that we're going to live for all eternity with Christ. Can you give the Lord some praise for that today? He loves you. Amen. The second find that, second thing that we find In this treasure chest is salvation or deliverance. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son for what reason? He came to give us life. He came to save us. So salvation and deliverance. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have 
What is it? Everlasting life. Not just temporary life, but everlasting life. Jesus calls us to himself in Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all you who weary, who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest. And what does he say? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Satan wants to bind you in his yoke. Mm. But the anointing, the yoke-breaking anointing that Jesus brought is totally the opposite. He doesn't yoke you down. He yokes you up alongside of him because he wants you to be with him because he loves you and he has a purpose and he wants to teach you. (laughs) And because he loves you with an everlasting love, he can be trusted with your life and with your circumstances. There's nothing that goes unnoticed by your loving Jesus. He gave everything to save you and to give you hope. And that's what this message is about today. He gives us love. We know that in the Old Testament, we were given the law and the prophets. But we know that the law cannot save us. According to New Testament scriptures, it was his love that drew us to to repentance and gave us a reason to trust him, a reason to surrender our lives to the only one that we should surrender our lives to. These great words of our Lord have been a balm of healing to millions of weary Christians. God does not promise a life devoid of hardship. But for those who have attempted to carry their own burdens and earn their own salvation, it is water to a man in a desert who is dying of thirst. Jesus saw that humanity was harassed and helpless in Matthew 9, 36. The sheep of his pasture were thirsty for living water. He himself will lead us by still waters for a peaceful drink. Weary and burdened, is a perfect way to describe the state of men and women on earth in today's hurried society more than ever. But the Savior beckons us to stop and look to him for rest. Isaiah 30, 15, and repentance and rest is your salvation, and quietness and trust is your strength. But you would not have it. How hard it is for us in our flesh to do the one thing that would be easiest, and that is simply to trust him and lay our burden at the feet of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm so thankful that Jesus saved me and saved you. And if you haven't yet received Jesus, we're going to give you opportunity to do that in a little bit. It's a choice that you will never regret. You have to give him everything but it's worth it. It's truly worth it because he loves you and he has a purpose for your life. The final thing and the final point I have is healing. And we find that is a familiar chapter in Isaiah 53, 5, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. Our healing is both spiritual and physical. They were both paid for by Jesus. Physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual healing belongs to us through the death, the burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I know it's not Easter Sunday yet. We're about four or five weeks out yet, I think. But God gave me this message of hope for you today. We serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. In John 10.10, another familiar passage, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. That is Jesus' call to us. He beckons us to himself. He is your Savior. He loves you with an everlasting love that will never fail you. Hallelujah. And he has salvation and deliverance for you today. 
and he also has healing in store for you today as well. I'm going to ask the praise team to come back. We saved this last song, and this song goes right along with this message, and it speaks it better than I can speak it. But in the in conclusion of my message today, when it seems like all earthly hope is gone, place your trust in Jesus. Jesus is our example. In Hebrews 12, 2, it states, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we need to look to Jesus. We try to fill our lives with things that make us happy. But no matter what you put in your life to try to fulfill happiness, aside from Christ, will not get the job done. But if you put Jesus first, and you put kingdom first, the Lord's kingdom first, he says that all of these things will be added unto you. Despair, or the opposite of hope, is the lack of faith, hope, and love. Without these three things, we just can't make it. We will never be able to finish our race or fulfill our destiny without these three essential things. Hope is like oxygen to the soul. Faith is believing that there is a God in heaven that loves us with an everlasting love and that he will never, ever, ever, ever abandon you. So the choice is ours today and every day that we're alive and still breathing. We can either believe it and receive it, or on the other hand, we can neglect this so great of salvation and we can lose it. I want to be on the side of believing it and receiving it because God says that if we believe with all our heart that we will receive him and all that he has for us as his children. So make the choice today. In Psalm 27, 13 through 14, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Wait, I say, on the Lord. In Isaiah 40, 31, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. How is this possible? It's only possible through our Lord Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Just a real quick example of this, and we're going to sing and we're going to give you an invitation to prayer. If you have a need today, inside or outside, we would like um, you to put your hand out the window. If you're outside in a car and one of our, our prayer ambassadors will come by and pray with you for you. Because that's why we're here. God loves you. We're not just checking another box to say we were good and came to Sunday service, but we're here on purpose because we have a purpose. We have a hope, and his name is Jesus. So that example is the word pneuma. This is where we get our word pneumatic. So if you're in a machine shop or if you're in a body shop or in construction, or something along those lines, you're familiar with pneumatic tools. But that tool in and of itself has no value, no purpose by itself. But if you trace that hose back to its source, the compressor, all of a sudden that tool has life and it has purpose. So God is the generator. He is the source through the Holy Spirit. He is the wind or the pneuma, or the life. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was at, without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God ho hovered over the waters. And then God started to talk. He started to speak. And guess what? Things started to happen. Things started becoming alive. Why? 
because he's God. And only God can do certain things that you need to, to have done in your life today. So if you'll connect yourself, the tool, if you will, to the power source, the pneuma of the Holy Spirit, you not only will be well and active, but you will be able to be a great blessing to those around you, to your family, to this church where you work. God has a plan and he has a purpose for you and he has a hope. Let's sing this song. Give the Lord praise. He's worthy. Amen.